He was ill a very long time, but it was not the prison life, the labor, rags, food or shaven head that brought him low. In 1988, The Cure were about to reach superstardom, but not everything was pitchy behind closed doors. Lol Tollerst, founder member and keyboard player in the band, had a nasty drinking problem. As the band was working long hours to record Disintegration, a history-making album, Lol was unable to play even a single note. Things got out of hand in December 1988. During Disintegration's last session, Tollerst clumsily dismissed the album. Half of it was shit, he said. Even his best friend, Rob Smith, finally had enough. What happened next turned Tollerst and Smith's friendship into bitter resentment, and out of resentment, Lowell lost everything he had, yet this was probably the one thing that saved his life. How? Hello to Potters, this is Simon Mas, your friend with a master's degree in music, who is about to tell you one of the most touching real-life stories of fall and redemption you might have heard in a long time, if you care to keep watching, that is. Christmas 1988, a dreadful time for the Cure's Lol Tollerst. If he didn't drink, he had delirium tremens, and if he did drink, he lost control so completely he was afraid of what he could do. But that was not the worst. Lol was waiting. Away from everything, in his new home in the middle of Dartmoor National Park. Finally, he received the letter he was waiting for. It came from Robert. It said what Lol already suspected. He was out of the cure. Lol was devastated. Estranged from the band that he considered his family. Alcoholic. Out of control. It must have looked like the bottom of the pit. Maybe Lol thought of the morning of his first school day in 1964, the local bus stopping near the pavement, his mother telling his five-year-old self, hold Robert's hands now and look after each other. That was Robert Smith's hand, by the way. The two had been inseparable since then, but now Smith's letter was clear. Please don't build a wall between us, but don't try to change my mind. 1989 came and Tullers tried to get his life in shape. I did what most alcoholics do in this situation. I took a hostage. I got married to Lydia. But married life didn't change much at all. That summer I spent all my time at the local pub. I had only been married for a few months and things were not going well. Dollars decided it was time to clean up for real. Eight weeks in rehab, and he was clean, and he stayed clean for more than a year. But then, right when things started looking normal again, the shit really hit the fan. What do you think happened? While you think about it, put a like to this video and or drop me a comment with your constructive suggestions. Your interactions will tell YouTube this video is worth showing to other music lovers, and most importantly, they'll tell me how I'm doing. It's much easier to give you the content you want if you actually tell me about your preferences, don't you think? 1994. Mr. Lawrence Andrew Tullers sues Mr. Robert James Smith, leader of the Cure and former best friend, and Mr. John Christopher Parry, manager of the Cure and founder of their label, Fiction Records. Tullers was seeking higher royalty rates for the time he was a Cure and joint ownership of the name The Cure. After dropping that bombo new, though, we need to go back to see how this mess started. 1990. A sober Lol Tollerst wanted to go back to music making, but he had a problem. He had been kicked out of the cure, alright, 
But was he free from any contractual obligation with their label? No use to form a new band, record an album, and then discover he couldn't release it. Law contacted a law firm to clarify the matter. Having looked at the papers, the lawyers made an interesting discovery. When The Cure renewed their agreement with Fiction in 1986, Lol had been demoted. He had been turned into a contracted performer of a company called Smith Music. Deep inside, Lol knew what had happened. His alcoholism was getting increasingly out of control, and Fiction's boss, Parry, thought it was more desirable to deal with Robert Smith alone. After all, Robert had been the driving force within the band, but the lawyers made it sound like Tullerst had been wronged. A dark voice whispered in Lowell's ears. What better chance to take a little revenge on Robert, the cure, fiction, and everyone who had treated him so bad? Sure, he had been drinking a lot, but the rest of the cure were hardly angels. Wasn't it time to give them some of the pain he had suffered since that Christmas in 1988? The lawyers suggested requesting further contracts and papers, and Lol agreed. In a sense, he got what he wanted. This legal pebble started an avalanche of distress to his old friend Robert. The curious activities came to a halt at the end of 1993 when the matter was clearly heading to court. Robert regretted the credits he had generously given Lowell for songs he had never written. But while in court, Tullerst came to realize how senseless the whole deal was. Robert was infuriated and grieved. The resentment spilled to the papers which had a field day stirring up dirt about the band and Lol himself. Tullerst started to feel that it was going to end horribly a long time before the sentence came out. And he was right. The court ruled against all of Lol's claims. He was left with a mountain of legal fees to pay. His reputation was in tatters. He had estranged his former best friend, and sadly, this was not rock bottom yet for Lawrence. It would come soon. As soon as I ask you to subscribe to this channel, hitting 1000 subscribers will get me pennies from YouTube, thanks to your ads watching, and I can use the money to make more and better content. Tolos really hit rock bottom once he reached his wife Lydia in California. As soon as he landed, she told him she wanted a divorce. Lol was now stuck in Los Angeles if he wanted to see his newborn son. And with child maintenance and all the legal fees still to pay, Tullers became effectively homeless. He was forced to crash at friends' homes for months. I had no band, no wife, no place to live on my own and only about 25% of my income to live on. While I was technically clean and sober, I was fucking miserable. On the 1st of May 1995, Lol couldn't take LA anymore. He decided to escape, to drive to a place with no buildings, no people, no nothing. The Death Valley. He drove all day into the desert, only stopping to sleep at dawn he left the cheap motel and drove on. Later that day, as he was cruising into the nothingness with 55 degrees outside, something magical happened. I felt my mind let go of all the pain and resentments of the past few months, and a smidgen of light squeezed back into my soul. That was it. Like a real-life Raskolnikov, Lawrence Tollerst had forgiven himself of all of his mistakes. A new life was about to start, one in which Lol found new love, started making music again, and finally he reconciled with Robber Smith. Because this video is already running too long, but I owe this to the two or three of you who are still watching. 
When the Cure's 2000 Blood Flowers tour reached the LA, LOL went to meet Robert. The two friends got a heart to heart after 11 years of not speaking to each other. LOL started to make amends, but he didn't finish. I looked up in midstream to see Robert's smiling face and I realized I had already been forgiven. The prodigal son could finally return home. For the 2011 Reflections tour, Tullers actually rejoined The Cure on the stage, but as good old Fyodor Dostoevsky put it in Crime and Punishment, this might well form the theme of a new tale. The one we wish to offer the reader is ended. Keep your eyes open for more music-related content and perhaps Keep up to date and get some extra bit by joining my Telegram channel with this QR code or by clicking the link in the description. This was Simon Mas, my dear top hatters. Stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye! Simon Mas, music you love.